On this week's Carrier Wrap, we speak with Exploit on its work with LTE broadcast technology and recent developments across that market segment. All right, well, thanks for joining us from this week's uh, Carrier Wrap. I'm your host, Dan Meyer. I'm the Editor-in-Chief for RCR Wireless News. And this week, we are joined by Ulu Sari, who's the uh, VP for Business Development Strategic, Strategic Accounts at Exploy, to talk to, about uh, the LTE broadcast space, which I think I know uh, has been around the industry for quite some time, but uh, get some updates from Exploit on the technology. So, uh, Ulu, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks very much, Dan, for inviting me, and uh, very happy to be giving a pitch about LT Broadcast and where we are today. Very great. Well, maybe we'll start off with those who don't know much about the company, maybe a little background uh, on Exploit, kind of what you guys do, where you guys are based, uh, kind of what you guys do in the, in the market. Sure. So LT Broadcast is really what we live and breathe right now. Um, the company has been working in mobile uh, broadcast for almost 10 years now. We are now at the fifth generation of our software. Um, and obviously, uh, we have gone through the, uh, the learning curves of doing DDBH, ISDB TMM, ATS CMH, all that good stuff. Uh, from our perspective, it has been a good learning curve because, uh, in fact, the kernel of the software is still the same. In all these standards, now obviously at LD Broadcast, it's 3GPP. Uh, they have identified that the same uh, core competencies what we have in our, in our software are still absolutely necessary, which is the food stack. Uh, forward error correction. And in fact, today in LD Broadcast deployments, what we see around the world, we are involved in all of them. And I would say happy also to be participating in most of the trials as well. We are providing two important software for the industry. We have something which is called uh, LD Broadcast middleware, which is the, let's say, the software stack, which is on top of the uh, LTE modem and below the application. So it's kind of like a, you could consider it on the smartphone, tablet, home gateway, what have you, all kinds of form factors that way we have integrated with. You could consider it like it's, um, it's like the good old old fashioned switchboard where the person is calling in and then the lady is connecting the call. So that's exactly what we do. Uh, we also have a software, which is the server software, which is basically taken the, from the origin server, uh, the BMSC, uh, into, the, into our BMSC product, where we, let's say, transcode it in such a format so that it can be sent over the ENOPs to the LTE network. So these two end-to-end -end components, we are very much committed into the 3GPP standard, so we work uh, we have done lots of interoperability work, for example, with Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, and all these guys with our middleware. And then equally with our server product, we have done the same work, for example, with Qualcomm and their middleware. Um, and this is, this is really the core competence what we bring into the picture is that when you want to have a healthy ecosystem of devices, that's when we are always getting on board. And uh, today we, for example, power the Verizon deployment in the US, as well as um, Samsung is one of our global accounts uh, on the device side. So when these guys deploy LT broadcast on their device, they, they incorporate our SDK, uh, as well as we are working with Telstra, with Reliance Geo Infocom. So that's, that's, and obviously here, hoping that we are spreading the word so that we get even more carriers on the bandwagon. Very good. Well, maybe for those who don't know much about the technology itself, maybe at a high level, what uh, is LTE Broadcast? I, th I think, you know, again, it's been around for quite some time. I think we've seen, you know, quite a bit, like I said, deployments out there, a lot of commercial trials. I guess from your guys' point of view, what is the basics of what LTE Broadcast uh, brings to market? Well, I would say that, you know, today when the, when the video consumption is like in a crazy rise and especially on mobile, uh, mobile devices, basically the, the, the computer of the household now, as they yeah. say, um, my, oh, our point is that why would you send the same content uh, to all of these devices, which is basically the streaming technology, which, which is happening in the LTE only, in the unicast technology. If you utilize the same content, why would you send it to millions of people uh, separately? Mm -hmm. So the point is that how we can leverage the good old TV technology, the good old broadcasting, but actually bring it into the mobile world. And obviously the benefit for the content provider 
is better quality of service. So if you are, if you want to have your brand looking like neat and crisp and HD, uh, you don't want to have adaptive bit rating, uh, bit rate to kick in and uh, make it into a pixel porridge. Uh, that's absolutely what we can guarantee that if it's sent in HD, it's actually also received in HD. Uh, for carrier, obviously the benefit is that they can ensure that, hey, we are offloading terabytes from their network because they can use broadcasts sent once to everybody rather than, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, each and every one getting the separate stream. And obviously for the end user, there is a lot of uh, benefits because this often, this technology can be used for, for example, for zero rating uh, type of, uh, you know, situations. And obviously they as well appreciate the good quality. Interesting, interesting. Now, I know it does seem like, like you said, I mean, it, it's a technology that it just seems like it's a, it's a, it's a given. I mean, again, like you said, I mean, the video uh, demand is just growing out there so much and for operators to try to uh, serve, service that on a one-to-one -one basis just seems kind of ridiculous. Uh, they're always looking for ways to be more efficient with their net, with their spectrum and with their network. Uh, I guess, but it looks, when you look at the robustness of the platform out there, uh, I mean, is LT broadcast uh, ready for commercial widespread commercial deployments to allow operators to really be that kind of that, that one-to-many deployment model for this? Or, I mean, is it, is it enough where an operator should be comfortable with, with the platform today? So uh, interesting that you're actually asking that question because this is also what I get, um, just mobile world commerce, which was on, la on last week. People yeah. are asking, is this real? Is this really happening? And the reality is that it has been on as a deployed service, for example, at Verizon and KT already, I, I think one and a half years now. Yeah. So it's a, it's a technology which has been rolled out nationwide in Korea, in the US. Um, and the thing is that obviously for that reason, it has to be carrier grade because otherwise it would not work. However, the challenge for, for example, for x -Way, where, like I said, we uh, live and breathe LT broadcast. The challenge is that the carriers in these, uh, in these both companies, they, they leverage it, it with their Go90 app, for example, at Verizon. Yeah. Go90 app is an application that even if you are only a unicast user, you can still use the same application. Um, but some of the content is actually uh, sent over broadcast. When there is popular concerts or when there is, let's say, Super Bowl or something like that, that everybody is tuning into the same content and into the same stream, that's when uh, Verizon is actually leveraging the, the broadcast part. So it's a combination of broadcast and unicast in the application. But obviously the end user doesn't care in which tube they're getting the content from. So this is not something that Verizon is actively advertising to the end users that, hey, we have deployed LT broadcast uh, because it's not relevant for the end user. This is also the same thing where we realized that Reliance Geo uh, uh, went on air with the Geo TV application last week. So also in the Indian market nationwide, they have deployed uh, LT broadcast, but like Verizon, they are also not sharing the fact that in fact they are leveraging the multicast. Um, and obviously for, let's say for a vendor like ourselves, who's like trying to bang the drum and make everybody to join this uh, wonderful initiative, <laughs> it, kind of we get the question that, but hey, is this really happening? Well, yes, it is. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so for the most part then, people should assume that this is being used in kind of those um, events where it's like, like you said, like streaming a, a concert or a certain event to multiple people. It's not really something that maybe is being used if I just want to bring up a YouTube clip. Uh, it's more something that's targeted towards kind of those big events that you want to transmit or broadcast to, to a large number of people at one time. That's actually a good point what you are making because it, in, indeed YouTube is like a smorgasbord of uh, all kinds of content and it, the whole premise of the service is that every, you can find anything which is individually targeted almost for you. So there obviously Unicast is a big big thing for them but however even at uh, YouTube or if you take for example Netflix and uh, Amazon video etc you have lots of content which is viewed by everyone everybody's what let's say one one example which has been uh, used a lot is is basically the house of cards mm -hmm. so house of cards when they release the second season within that uh, uh, within that weekend when it was actually on air, 50% of all the, all the um, viewers were tuning in binge watching the whole series. And obviously as this was done over Unicast, everybody is streaming individually. So when you think about this kind of content that as 
Netflix knows exactly what the end users are doing and what they are watching because they have the recommendation engine, et cetera. They could easily allow, for example, the caching of the second season into the, in the, into the application so that once the end user starts watching, uh, it's already there. You're not streaming, but you're actually watching something which has been pre-cached into your home gateway or on your mobile application, et cetera. And by the studies also what we have realized is that once you do this kind of pre-caching, meaning that it's very fast zapping, you can fast forward, et cetera, uh, the retention by the end users grows by 40%. So end users appreciate it as well. And of course there is the, the, the benefit that if it is cached on your device, you can take it in your pocket you can go, let's say to your uh, summer cottage or, or a sailboat where you don't necessarily have the network coverage but you still have your favorite program. Interesting. Yeah, I see like, yeah, people who travel a lot for flying on a plane or something like that, if you can download it that way and, and access it that way, it makes a lot of sense too. So, yeah. but I, I guess now, I mean, is there a, a specific reason why operators aren't being more vocal about this? Is it, I mean, because that would seem to be kind of like, you know, are they, are they, are they nervous about it? I mean, I mean like you said, it's, it's carrier grade, it's ready for operators to be using. Um, you know, are you surprised that operators aren't more vocal about it or do you think that they're, that they're going about it the right way in terms of, you know, not, not hyping another technology out there, just, just putting something out there that works and that customers don't know about, but it works behind the scenes and it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Do you think there's any sort of challenge of trying to get operators more on board with touting this service? I, I think there is two major reasons. <coughs> Maybe uh, if I would summarize, the other one is typically that today, if you don't have zero rating uh, for your data, you know, there is no need for you necessarily to be so much so pushy about offloading from your, from your network because in the end, the end user is paying what they're watching. Yeah. However, for example, now looking at US and what has happened with T-Mobile, who started the Ben John program, and now all of a sudden Verizon and AT&T are both doing the same thing. Yeah. I think there is much more interest to be more efficient with the bits and bytes, what, they are, what you are shipping to your end user. Because if everybody's tuning into the same content, video content is also large. If you can offload and basically uh, secure that frequency, which is an asset which is doesn't which doesn't grow in the trees, and you can leverage that, for example, for multi services or or some other services, let's say e-commerce or something, which is let's say in the pricing structure has more value. I mean, why wouldn't you do it? Then there is also the other thing is that um, if you if you are a network operator, let's say RAN vendor. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of interest for them to keep on deploying those inner fees because the thing is that the, the probably the, the pricing margin there is better. So it's a bit of a kind of like a cannibalizing situation for yeah. them as well, how much they want to push the technology to their carrier customers uh, because they are eating out of their own profits. So. Yeah. Uh, that's the reason why, you know, you have Xway. We are the Switzerland of the business. <laughs> <laughs> Basically providing both the server and the middleware enabling this. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, we definitely always need more Switzerlands in this industry, that's for sure. But, uh, but I, I guess now when you look at what the operators can, can save by going down this route, I mean, do you guys have any sort of numbers or what do you guys think in terms of what operators are able to save in terms of perhaps virtual efficiency? Uh, you know, obviously money is an important part too, but what do you guys think in terms of what operators are actually benefiting from when they deploy uh, this type of LT broadcast type of service? So I have, a, I have a good example from a very recent, I have an operator who was basically looking into deploying what we call fixed wireless TV. It's a critical part of their service. Uh, they have been recently granted in certain markets, which I won't be going into too much detail right now, but they have been granted the LTE uh, frequency by the government. So now they are thinking that, okay, I want to build a service offering on this. And rather than just competing neck to neck with the broad, broadband providers, I want to provide something extra, something else. And as they have TV content already, they thought that, okay, let's do this. Let's uh, provide a triple play package, meaning that I provide TV. TV is an incremental part of my service offering. And I want to target the big screen TV because in my market, everybody watches football. And uh, the thing was that uh, there was another vendor who was basically promoting the LTE only path and then uh, X-Way participating with the other vendor providing the LT plus LT broadcast. And in fact, what we, what we showed because of triggered by this request 
and uh, our experts who, who work very closely with the 3GPP standard and you know crunch the numbers, we realized that with the same network deployment, first you can uh, reach because we are leveraging broadcast, you can reach four times more customers with the same network uh, build out. So obviously your return on investment is way much better. But not only that, uh, there is also the fact that if you, if you deliver to the big screen TV, uh, let's say football or whatever content, and you are, let's say, in unfortunate situation that your content is very popular, but you had only the unicast, what happens is, again, you might be, if you are lucky, you will get the pixel porridge because mm -hmm. of the adaptive bit rate, or the worst case scenario, you get a black screen. So would you be an end user who paid for this service? You paid for the service provider to provide you TV, but you didn't get it in the critical moment. This would also mean that you would be probably giving a nasty call to the customer service. That was probably also the reason why we won the deal. Uh, while because L there are some use cases where LT broadcast is simply necessary because otherwise we will not be able to provide the service in a good sense, sustainability and in good quality of service. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, yeah, it does seem like, like you said, I mean, it just seems like such an important part of the, of the, this move towards video nowadays too. I mean, you know, again, if obviously there's, there's some deployment involved in it and obviously, you know, you have to have the equipment out there, you got the, the inodes out there, you got to have the devices out there. Uh, but if you can get that stuff out there, it seems like a, it's a nice way to kind of bolster what you have out there. And again, the savings are always going to be nice for the operators too. So uh, it does seem like, you know, not to say it's a no brainer, but uh, obviously for a lot of operators, it seems to make, make a lot of sense for them. Uh, I guess when you look at the terms of overhead and uh, when it comes to the spectrum needed for this, I know I talked to an operator uh, last year about this here in the U.S. And, you know, they were a little bit still hesitant on kind of going LTE broadcast. And he'd mentioned something about, you know, there is some overhead requirement in terms of spectrum that maybe in the, in the early stages is not being perhaps utilized enough because there's not enough customers on it. Again, as customers ramp up, it, it would be utilized. But I guess what are you seeing in terms of necessary or needed overhead? Uh, I mean, how much spectrum does an operator need to kind of set aside to support uh, an LT broadcast channel. That's a good point. We are actually we just came out with the uh, at Mobile World Congress with a press release uh, of our work what we are currently doing with Telstra in Australia. So Ericsson is their network provider and they're leveraging our uh, middleware on the on the devices. Mm -hmm. And basically, what we are deploying together with them, uh, we have defined a profile for what they call MOOD in the uh, 3GPP standard. MOOD stands for Multicast Operations on Demand, meaning that uh, based on the usage pattern or what's happening within the cell area, if a certain threshold, what the carrier themselves decides, that let's say that within the cell, if you are over two people, it automatically switches over broadcast. Uh, this obviously is something that uh, you don't need to have operational folks pressing the button and you know starting the multicast. You know when there is Super Bowl or you know because obviously in situations where you you might know in advance that hey this is going to be a popular content, yeah. so you could do that. But then sometimes. You absolutely cannot anticipate, you know, what is going to be popular and meaning that the network is now doing it automatically is going to be a, a game, game changer for mm -hmm. LT broadcast for sure. Uh, Telstra is the first one uh, that we are deploying this feature with and this will be later on available also for our other customers. So looking forward to making those bits even more efficient in the carrier's networks. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I guess maybe looking forward a bit too down the road. I know, you know, you go to these events on our mobile con, just 5G was a huge topic there. I think everybody in the mobile space uh, has got to have some sort of 5G slide in their, in their PowerPoint deck at some point. But I guess as you guys look ahead towards kind of this evolution towards new technologies, I mean, how do you see LT broadcast playing in that 5G space? And obviously it's a 3GPP standard, so it's going to be part of the whole process there. Uh, do you see LT broadcast evolving with this move towards 5G? Do you think I, I guess, what's your general view on how that will kind of move with, with this move towards, uh, you know, next, next generation technology? It, it's, a, it's a constant run. I would say that one, there is always, there was, there was 2G, then there was 3G and 4G and now 5G. And every time there, there is a small period of time when the, the new G works okay. And then, boom, that becomes clogged. So I would say that we don't see any reduction in the, the way... Uh, you know, people are consuming data on, on uh, mobile that just keeps on growing. And I would say that even more, because in the future, we are also seeing the uh, IoT of things, internet, you know, is becoming 
to your, you know, you see at CES, your pillows are connected, your bicycle, your fridge, and whatever is connected. And basically, if you think about that, doing software updates to all this myriad of devices out there, again, it's the same piece of software. Why would you do that in a unicast? And this is actually what we are currently discussing with a, uh, with a large uh, US carrier who's considered uh, especially more like, rather than you know, um, looking into um, EMBM or the LT broadcast like a consumer technology, but more like looking the en as an enterprise technology for them, and especially for connected cars. And the, the, the rules why this is completely simple. When you think about uh, you know, all the car manufacturers and carriers all over the world who are working together, they're connecting cars like millions per quarter. Uh, the software updates are becoming bigger and more frequent. And so you need to have a good mechanism how you're actually doing the software update in a, in a real, realistic and reliable way. And uh, more of, there is another use case which is also popping up for the connected cars when these cars are starting to communicate now with each other. And uh, you probably know a couple of years ago, there was this Jeep Cherokee hacking incident. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while, you know, the journalist is, is driving the car and then the hackers are jumping in and I don't know, 36 KPIs, they, they basically took over the car and uh, the journalist called in finally saying that, hey, can you guys please stop this demonstration? I'm now really scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I mean, journalists never, you know, they don't get scared. So I mean, well, I don't know about that. I'm not sure we're the, we're the bravest people out there, but who knows? Anyway, yeah, I know what you're saying though. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically what, uh, what the, the carrier is saying is that you need to have the broadcast component yeah. involved somehow, because once this happens really on a real world in a, in a situation and there is a car which has been hacked, you need to be able to communicate all the other cars around you that, hey, this Toyota, that Toyota, do not trust what that tri uh, the car is trying to communicate to you and exclude, make it on a blacklist. So this blacklist communication is going to be a critical part of the connected cars use case. Also, there are other use cases which we see which are happening now, which is related to the public safety and the private radio domain. Uh, we demonstrated, I think, a couple of, years, a couple of months ago uh, at a critical communications trade show in Dubai. We had a, a, basically our middleware was incorporated in a drone. And then you could consider that there is a situation where the drone is going into a far out location uh, remotely. Uh, you know, recording the video of an incident, would it be a terrorist attack, would it be, you know, whatever kind of uh, accident or power station, some kind of problem, and then transmitting that over LT network back to the uh, headquarters or let's say the transmission center, where it's uh, rerouted again back to the LT network, but this time over broadcast. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you can either direct this messaging, this video messaging and the real feed from that incident to everybody or maybe subgroups uh, the way you want to define it. And this is, this is already which is happening and what we see that now the different governments all over the world when they are putting the uh, requirements for public safety or the LTE are requiring that, hey, this kind of video communication is becoming critical for, for our next generation of uh, supporting the um, agencies. Yeah, makes sense. Well, it seems like there's lots of opportunities going forward on this technology. And again, for myself, you know, I remember covering, uh, you know, I've been covering this space for quite some time. And I remember 12, you know, 12 years ago, uh, you know, here in the US, we had this media flow network from Qualcomm come out. It was kind of almost one of the first really to kind of really push that one to many uh, type of type of platform. This is before LTE was even out there. And I remember growing up, you know, getting one of the phones and trying it out and thinking, you know, it was, it was a cool technology. Probably wasn't quite uh, fully developed yet, but it seemed like it worked pretty well. And uh, again, with this move to LT broadcast, it seemed like it's just kind of this evolution of what seems to really make sense for the mobile space, this one to many type of transmission, uh, just seems like a necessary thing to have out there. So it's good to kind of get an update on where we are in terms of that evolution. And like you said, it, it's, it's commercially ready now, it's out there in the public. So obviously we're to a point now where operators uh, seem like they should feel comfortable putting this in their, into their networks and customers are again are taking advantage of it as well. So uh, definitely great to get an update on kind of where that's at. So for me personally, it's good to get an update, but I'm sure for our listeners and our viewers too, uh, to check out as well. So uh, Ula, we definitely appreciate the insight on the topic. And, and again, as this kind of evolves more and more, hopefully we can touch base again soon going forward and get some more updates on, on the technology as it kind of evolves and all these different use cases, like you mentioned, uh, come into play as well. But uh, we definitely appreciate the time and insight today. Thanks so much.